3, Joel chapter 3 in the Old Testament. We're finishing out our study. We've been in Joel here for a few weeks. I was gone two or three weeks and we're back in it and uh, last week and then today we will actually uh, finish our study. Joel chapter 3 uh, there in the Old Testament. Yeah, what a blessing it was uh, a couple years back when the church gave us the trip to Italy. Um, I enjoyed the cuisine. I enjoyed all of the scenery and uh, remember the bus rides and all the beautiful views. But one of my favorite stops was uh, in Florence. We went to the Uffizi Museum and I love artwork. I love to look at it. I love to imagine in my mind what the artist had in mind when they were creating these wonderful works. Uh, this particular museum in Europe is one of the most popular and acclaimed and artists, famous and not so famous from the 14th to 16th century. Um, their work is displayed there, but among the various paintings, also there were a number of statues and then busts of various individuals, specifically uh, the Roman uh, leaders, the, the Caesars. And, uh, you know, as we think about it, um, that was a significant time in the history of the church. For instance, one of the busts there was the Emperor Nero, and you've heard the saying that uh, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. And you remember around 63 or 64 AD, the city of Rome burned, and guess who he blamed? He blamed the Christians. Uh, there was also a bust of Caligula, who was popularly known as uh, the most influential and recognized among all of Rome's leaders. There was Augustus, Tiberius, Claudius, Marcus Aurelius, a full body statue of Trajan, and there were numbers, I think just about every uh, Roman leader uh, was mentioned there. But something very interesting I noted belief, be, beneath each bust was a starting date and then a dash and an ending date. And I, I want to appeal to you today as we're looking at the close here in Joel chapter 3 that every leader in history has had a number after the dash. Not so for Jesus. In the book of Daniel, God gives the Babylonian emperor um, a vision, a vision of a statue. And uh, this statue was a vast statue and it disturbed Nebuchadnezzar because he could not understand the meaning of this vision that he had, nor could any of the astrologers or any of the soothsayers or any of uh, those type of people. Only Daniel, through the power of God, was able to give an interpretation. It had a head of gold. That head represented Nebuchadnezzar himself, the head of the Babylonian Empire at that time. There were uh, chests and arms of silver representing the Medo-Persian Empire that would follow chronologically. And then there were the stomach and thighs of bronze represented, uh, representing rather the Greek Empire at its heyday. Alexander uh, was its leader. And then the legs of part iron and part clay representing um, really two different entities, the Roman Empire of which I was able to uh, observe in, in that museum, but also a future empire, the Bible speaks, that is going to be much like it. And this empire that's going to come is going to be headed by uh, one of the worst, the worst, will be the worst figures physically in history, Antichrist. But it's very interesting as you look at all of these kingdoms who have come and gone that there's always a number after the dash. And so the scripture tells us that every one of these empires was supplanted by another. Even the Roman Empire imploded from within. Yet God presented in that vision a stone very clearly that was cut not by the hands of men. It was hewn not by man's hand, a divine stone. That was representative 
of Jesus Christ. And it says, of this stone, there will be no end. And so for Jesus, there is no number after the dash. So today, as we look in Joel chapter 3, we're seeing a lot of things that are going to be happening. But the main thing we want to bring out is God has set up his eternal kingdom. And as eternal king, he's returning. We've been talking about the day of the Lord and, and how this day is a sure and certain day. How there have been various days of the Lord when God has acted directly and in judgment. But there's going to be that ultimate day of the Lord, which is marked by Jesus return. And so we see that what we're looking here in uh, chapter 3 of Joel, beginning in verse 12, is something that is future to us. It's a time when God is going to judge the nations who have set themselves against him and individuals who have set themselves against him. It is a time where God will restore and lift up his own, those who are truly his, and when he will bring to an end this age as we know it. Look with me at uh, Joel chapter 3 verse 12. Let the nations be roused and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit down to judge all the surrounding nations. Swing the sickle because the harvest is right. Come and trample the grapes because the wine press is full. The wine vats overflow because the wickedness of the nations is extreme. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will cease their shining. The Lord will roar from Zion and make his voice heard from Jerusalem. Heaven and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the Israelites. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. Jerusalem will be holy and foreigners will never overrun it again. And that day the mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the streams of Judah will flow with water and a spring will issue from the Lord's house watering the valley of Acacias. Egypt will become desolate and Edom a desert wasteland because of the violence done to the people of Judah in whose land they shed innocent blood. But Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. I will pardon their blood guilt which I have not pardoned for the Lord dwells in Zion. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, that as we saw last week, you're the great designer of this puzzle that is all that is happening. And that, Lord, you're going to bring it piece by piece together until the picture is complete. Lord, I pray today within the sound of my voice that if there be any who have not trusted you, who have not made peace with you through Christ, today would be that day. And that, Lord, also you might stir our hearts, that we might share the truth that you're coming back with our friends. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, today as we look at uh, this last message here in Joel, I want to divide our look really into two parts. First, we're going to see God's reaction uh, on this coming day. And second, we're going to see what results from this coming day. So first, we're going to see what is actually happening in that day. And then as we move to the last few verses, we're going to see the resultant state of that day. But as we talk about this day of the Lord, and again, it's important that we define the day of the Lord. It's not a day. It's not multiple days. It's a significant day, specifically in the context here, where God is going to return and establish his kingdom. And some will be ready and some will not. And so the question I have for you today first is this, are you ready should that day come? We need to be ready before and not after that time. And secondly, if you are ready, are you communicating the fact that he is coming back to others? First, I want to look at God's reaction to this coming day. And we see it in verses 12 through 16. This world, as we know it, is not heading around in a circle. It is heading in a historic Line. There are no mulligans. There's no repeat of history. Uh, there's none of this reincarnation. The Bible is very clear that history is headed in a direction and it's headed toward a certain day. And throughout 
uh, the, our study in Joel, we have seen reference to this coming day. But not only here in Joel, we saw last week that Amos in chapter 5 and verse 18 warned individuals who thought they were ready for that day, said, you better be careful because that day will not be a day of light for you, but a day of darkness. There's some people that believe they'll be ready for that day, but in reality, or not. People throughout history have looked toward this day. Some people going against scripture have wrongly said they know exactly when that day will be. The scripture says that no one will know uh, the day nor the hour, but we can know the season. We can know, as we see in Romans chapter 24, uh, the things that will mark the time period of that day. And, and even as we can recognize things in nature and we can look and see things change uh, in nature and how we can say, okay, summer's coming because of this or fall is coming because of this. There are certain events that will help us understand the time frame of when he is coming. And so, you know, Jesus warned about this day. In fact, in um, Matthew chapter 25, as part of Jesus' Olivet Discourse, those two chapters, Matthew 24 and 25, in chapter 25, he told the parable of 10 women, 10 virgins, who were waiting on the arrival of a bridegroom. And in this parable, Jesus said, five were wise and five were not. Five came with an ample supply of oil. Five did not. Well, you know, the, the groom did not come in a timely manner or how they thought in an expedient manner. There was a long delay, and so long that the five who were foolish did not have enough oil. And so they went to the five wise and they said, will you share some of yours? And the five wise, they had to look out for themselves. They said, if we give you part of what we have, then, then we won't be ready and, and ours will go out. And so the five who were foolish had to go into town to purchase the oil. And while they were gone, the bridegroom arrived. Now, what do we learn from that? That on this coming day, there are going to be some who are ready and some who are not. I, I pray to the Lord today that you're ready. But, I, but we're also going to see as we're studying this that it's not just enough that we be ready, but we should desire that our neighbors be ready, that the, the person who cuts our hair is ready that the person we see in town is ready, that we go to school with is ready. And, and so as we've noted in, in these past two weeks, Joel's prophecy is primarily to nations. He, he's bringing and speaking judgment uh, to the nations who have set themselves against God. But we know in other parts of Scripture that this coming day will not just be a day of the accountability of nations, but individuals. After all, nations are made up of individuals. And so God, as he speaks judgment, uses two figures of speech in that day uh, to represent the harvesting uh, of those who have set themselves against God. And, and so the first we see is the sickle that's being swung. And we see that. Secondly, we see the wine press that is squeezing the juice in verse 13. In fact, it says the wine vats overflow because the wickedness of the nations is extreme. And so we know that this judgment is specifically a judgment of the unrighteous. And we're going to see the resultant state that there'll be those who are righteous, who will live in peace, who will live in the blessing of the Lord. But specifically here, the judgment is on those who the nations who have set themselves against God, the sickle will harvest. There'll be a time of accountability, a time that will be brought to a close. There'll be uh, the wine press that will be full, the vats that will overflow. And we see here that two things will be rattled on that day. Two things will sort of be shaken. And this day of the Lord is going to be a day that's unmistakable. In fact, in Revelations 1, 7, when Jesus comes, it says, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Now, the Jehovah's Witness, they'll try to say, well, Jesus has already came, come back. He, he came back in secret. That's false teaching. 
because the scripture says clearly that when Jesus comes back from the eastern sky to the west, every person will see him. His, his coming is not going to be in secret. It's going to be a sure thing. And there'll be some cosmic disturbances. So two things are going to be rattled. First, the creation around us. Look, the sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will cease their shining. Now, this isn't just talking about an eclipse because the moon will eclipse the sun. This is talking about uh, a total darkness of the created order. The Lord will roar from Zion and make his voice heard from Jerusalem. That doesn't sound like it's in secret to me. It sounds like it, it is very boisterous. Heaven and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the Israelites. So the first thing we see here is that created order will be shaken. Look with me very quickly at Isaiah 24. Isaiah in chapter 24. I need more hands. Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah 24 is an interesting chapter of the Bible. I came across, I've read the Bible a number of times and passed over it, but about, about two or three years ago, this chapter really jumped out at me because we know that God sent judgment upon the world, that the world was flooded and the world was destroyed. God made a promise with the rainbow that never again will the world be destroyed by water. We know that parts of the world can be flooded. Um, but look at Isaiah 24, uh, verse 1. Look, the Lord is stripping the earth bare and making it desolate. He will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. So he's speaking about the earth itself, the surface of the earth. Look at verse 5, or verse 4 rather. The earth mourns and withers, Isaiah 24 and verse 4. The world wastes away and withers. The exalted people of the earth waste away. The earth is polluted by its inhabitants, for they have transgressed teachings, overstepped decrees, and broken the permanent covenant. Now listen to me very closely. I'm a conservationist. I believe we should do what we should do to physically preserve this earth. It's part of our stewardship. But let's make no mistake. What's going to cause the earth to be destroyed is the sin of people. The sin of people. That's what the scripture says here. Now, back in Old Testament times, it was very clear. Anything that touched something, if it was unclean, it would become unclean. And so the Bible here is saying those of us who are sinful inhabitants of the world, our feet are touching this earth and the earth itself will be destroyed. And the scripture says one day it's going to be made anew. And so you, we don't have the time to go all through chapter 24, but we see that Isaiah concurs with what Joel is saying here, that there's going to be a shattering and, and a, a shaking of that which is around. But not only will the earth be rattled and squeezed, but there are those who set themselves against God. The same will happen to them. Many, many who have lived their lives in comfort to the neglect of God will be brought to account. It will be a, a rude awakening, the swinging of the sickle, the, the pressing of the wine press, speaking to judgment being enforced against, the, against those who have lived their lives with no regard for the Lord. Now look back at verse 14. It says multitudes, it's speaking of people here, and it's not speaking of created order uh, of the world around us. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now, who are these multitudes? There's some things first we need to understand. In the Hebrew, when something is repeated, it means it's going to happen, that, that it's, it's great, that it, it's, it's confirming it's going to happen. And so they're going to be many, many in number. And second, as we saw last week, as we looked at the prophecy in Zechariah, they're going to be nations that will be drawn like a hook drawing in a fish into the boat that are going to be drawn toward this valley of decision, the valley of Jehoshaphat. They're going to be a great multitude of people. And finally, these people will be brought to a point of decision. Now, it's not man's decision because at this point it's too late. Man has already set himself. Those who've set themselves against God have already done so, but it's going to be God's verdict. 
God's decision. So it's almost like he's mixing the metaphors here. He's speaking of a battle, but he's also speaking of a courtroom scene that all of the nations will be drawn. You realize God is powerful enough. He can just speak the word. In fact, when Jesus comes back in Revelation 19, there'll be a sword protruding from his mouth. And it speaks to the fact that all he has to do, he doesn't have to lift anything. He just says the word and, and people will be brought into judgment. Oh, how you need to be ready before that day and how you need to do all you can to inform others to be ready. But let's look at the result of the coming day in verses 17 and 21, that settled state after the day. The caption in my Bible reads this, Israel blessed. You know, there are great theologians who would differ from me and I respect them and I say this humbly, but with the deepest of conviction, um, that I believe God has a firm plan for the nation of Israel. Call me uh, a dispensationalist if you want. That's what I would take. I believe in the rapture of the church. I believe that when the church is raptured, that Israel uh, will, during a seven year period of tribulation, face a, a terrible time of turmoil, but will be a primary instrument of a witness for the Lord, the 144,000 witnesses, and that God will bring Israel to faith. And so I look at it practically. Think about it just for a moment. How can a people, six million annihilated in less than a decade, reconstitute as a nation? That doesn't make sense. Usually if that happens, you're on decline. You don't come back from it. Think scripturally about it. Romans says to the Gentiles, he said, don't be boastful. If you, a wild branch, can be grafted in to the natural, how much more can the natural one be brought back? In other words, the Jews who heard from the beginning, <clears throat> if God can save Gentiles in masses, what is it to say he couldn't save <clears throat> the Jews in masses? God is doing a work. How can you read these verses and I realize that God is speaking about a drawing in, a harvesting of the Jews who would believe in Christ. Now, it's very important. I need to qualify this. Not all of Israel will be saved. Not all of physical Israel. But there will be a remnant. And listen to me. This isn't going to be a tiny carpet remnant. This is going to be a lot, a lot. We know at least 144,000 are going to be witnesses. And so, you know, I will argue this to, to, to the day that I die. Jerusalem is God's city and it's the, for the nation of Israel. It's Israel's city. Not that I said it. That's what God says. Notice what he's speaking here. Notice how he uses the term Judah. That speaks to the southern kingdom. That speaks to the Davidic line. It speaks to Jesus coming through that. It's a specific problem, a promise. Not all of Israel will be saved. But I believe as time moves, the Jews are going to see their Jewish Messiah. They're going to see Jesus as the Messiah. You know, when I was in high school, I ran cross country. You say, why in the world did you run cross country? That was stupid. I did it because the varsity basketball coach was the cross country coach. And then you know how that works. He left the next year. It didn't help me out any, anyway. When I ran cross country, uh, it, it's not fun. It's a whole lot more fun running touchdowns in front of a thousand people in Buckingham than it is running through sticks in the middle of nowhere and hitting your head. I shared with the church before, our coach was really creative. He realized it gets really lonely running through the woods. We, with the exception of one, we had all male guys running. He had cheerleaders in their skirts at every quarter mile post. So about time you'd see the cheerleader in front, you'd be, and then you'd get by her, and about time she was out of sight, there'd be another one. But cross country was not fun, I'll be honest. You were jumping over creeks, you're getting hit with branches. But one thing was true about a cross country meet. It was not over, and we couldn't get on the bus and go home until the last person had come in. So the race hadn't finished. 
So the scripture here is speaking to the end times and is speaking to those who are going to be judged at the end, but there's also going to be a drawing in of those who are going to come in at the end time. God will bring all who will come into him. It's just like if you're moving cattle from one pasture to another, the job's not finished until the last one comes because you're not going to go back. And the result of that day is many, many will be blessed. So what's going to happen after this coming day of the Lord? Jesus will be manifest as king over all creation. Look at verse 17. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. Revelation 1, 7, we just looked at it. Every eye will see him and know that he is Lord. Zechariah chapter 14 is one of the great chapters prophetically in all of the Bible. One of my favorite chapters. And it concurs with what is said here in Joel chapter 3. And Zechariah 14, 10 says that Jerusalem will be elevated. In other words, what's going to literally happen that day? Everything around Jerusalem will be dropped down to a plain, will be leveled. And the holy city will be lifted up and you know who's going to be there the exalted one Jesus Christ the sun and moon will be darkened but we won't need the sun and moon because the light of the world Jesus Christ will provide that light uh, Zechariah 14 6 says the same thing Jesus will be exalted as the light of the world secondly all things will be put in proper order notice what it says here in that day, the mountains will drip with sweet wine, verse 18, and the hills will flow with milk. All the streams of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will issue from the Lord's house, watering the valley of Acacia. Notice the Lord's house is in the right place with the right occupant. Notice that the hills coming from Judah, they will flow with water. It will be a time of great order. But not only that, in verse 19, Egypt will become desolate, that enemy of God's people for years. And Edom, a desert wasteland. You know, Edom descended from Esau, but you know what happened uh, when the Jews were fleeing. The Edomites were sitting and and knocking and killing them off as they were trying to flee to safety. They were treating them not with mercy, but with judgment. And God says, because of the violence done to the people of Judah, these places will become desolate and be a wasteland. And then we see God is going to pardon his own. Look at verse 20. But Judah will be inhabited forever. And Jerusalem from generation to generation. This is his people. And we as Christians are his people, but these are Jews in great number that are going to come to know Jesus Christ. I will pardon their blood, get, blood guilt, which I have not pardoned, for the Lord dwells in Zion. I believe the scripture is very clear, the mercy of God, that before uh, the gate is closed to the pasture, before that last runner crosses the finish line, before all of this happens... There are going to be many, many Jewish people who will see the Lord for who he is. So that leaves us today with a question. What do we glean from this? First, Jesus is coming back. Second, he's coming to judge those individuals and nations who have neglected him, set themselves against him. Third, he's coming to show mercy to those who have received him. And fourth, the race is not over yet. Because that day has yet to come. The number of Jews and yes, the number of Gentiles to come into the faith is still not filled. So I, filled. So I return to the question we asked at the beginning, two of them. Are you prepared for this coming day? I implore you today, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. Adjust your life to him. This world is chaos that's going on around us. I was talking with someone last night and they said, you'd be amazed at the amount of drugs that's in this general area. It would, he said, it wouldn't shock if 30% of young people are, are faced directly with temptation of that. Everything we look around, the political system, the world system, it's all chaotic. Don't you want to hold on to the anchor, the Lord Jesus Christ? Wouldn't you believe in him today? Your need is not a particular person to be president. It's not to get the right education. It's not to have money. The need that you have at your core is to make peace with God, repent of your sin, make him Lord 
of your life. And so if you've not done that, today is the day. But if you've done this, are you helping others prepare for his coming? Wouldn't it be selfish to not? You know, from time to time when I'm working in my yard, somebody will stop by. I'm right at the corner. And I know why they're stopping. They're not stopping to say, boy, you're a good looking guy. They're not... They're not there to stop and say, man, that grass looks really nice. You're cutting it in nice row. They're there to say, can you tell me how to get to such and such? You've been there. But think about when you know, and many times I know, the feeling of satisfaction that you've helped someone who's in a pinch. It feels good. It does feel good. Sometimes, I'll be honest, maybe I love it. I even look to see, are they going the right way? Are they really doing it? But yet many times in our lives, we have the truth of the gospel and we clam up. It doesn't make sense. I mean, it doesn't. It frustrates me. It frustrates me with myself. It frustrates me. Why aren't you talking about it enough? Why aren't you doing it? You know why? Because the devil doesn't want us to talk about it very simply. Oh, you appear to be radical. Oh, you appear to be this. Oh, they don't want to hear. They'll reject. They're spiritual battles. We got to take people. We got to take people with us. I don't know how that is to you. You may say, I'm not good with words. Hey, Moses wasn't good with words, and look what God did with him. But we need to resolve that we'll be an instrument to lead people to Christ. It might be baking somebody a cake who doesn't know Christ and then going and sharing with that individual. You know, when I was a child, and I closed with this, um, I, I had a blessing. Um, my dad loved the Lord, loved to see people come to know the Lord, and we had an evangelistic crusade come to Appomattox. Now, how many of you have ever been to a drive-in movie? Raise your hand. All right, most everybody. Very few younger, but some. That's a novelty, isn't it? I may have been to a tractor pull. A lot of people have been to tractor pulls, all right? There used to be a lot of them. We have something coming that doesn't happen every day. In fact, it doesn't happen very much in the state of Virginia at all, an evangelistic crusade. It's not a revival. It's not a, even a, a prayer meeting. It's not a tent revival. The whole purpose is that people would bring people to come hear the gospel shared so that they could be saved. Now, if you're a Christian, God will have a message. Anytime God's word is open, it'll speak to you. There'll be people that are rededicating. But I remember being at the old Appomattox County football stadium, the middle school, a thousand people in cars riding by and then seeing droves of people believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But guess what? The only way that happened was people bringing people. There are a lot of signs you're going to see around. Go tell crusade. I've never seen a sign uh, speak to somebody about Christ. Now, God can use signs, but primarily, he's going to use people, inviting people. If you know Jesus today, there's some bookmarks. Eric's got some, I think, in the back. If I can find mine, here it is right here. It's a simple bookmark. You can use it. It's Go Tell America. A simple plan to reach out to those who need Jesus. On the back, you'll see a list of five numbers. You can pray for five people, but specifically praying either one or two or three or four or five or more. God, put it on my heart to pray for this person. And may that person come to hear the gospel. May they come to hear the gospel. September 29th through October 2nd, Sunday through Wednesday night, a little over a month away, every night there are going to be hopefully 1,000 to 2,000 people that are gathering specifically to hear the old-time gospel be preached to a new generation. And would you be there? But more than that, would you be praying that you would invite somebody? The resource you have, we'll be sure when you leave today that you'll have it. Each one, reach one. What would it be like if somebody came and, and uh, stopped by at the corner there and said, will you show me? And I knew where and said, well, I'm too busy, go on. They wouldn't think very much of me. We have the gospel. We need to communicate it. Let's be in prayer about it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today.
that you have a plan and that plan is unfolding even as I speak, even as we leave this place. And that plan is that you're going to bring this world as we know it to an end, the day of the Lord. And for those who are ready before that day, there's going to be great rejoicing. For those who are not ready, stands judgment and separation we know in a place called hell. Lord, uh, many of our neighbors, many of our friends, many of our co-workers, our fellow students, they don't know you. And Father, the devil will do everything he could to keep us from praying and for inviting. Lord, I pray you would invite. I pray you would bless this effort in our community as we seek to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray for the speaker, Rick Gage, and I pray as we look in the book of Jonah and the weeks ahead leading up to this, that you would stir our hearts, that we would care about people enough to share Christ, to do ministry. And Father, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.